Good afternoon. Almost evening. It's wonderful to see you and and study with you today. Day 8,964 of the quarantine. That's what it seems like anyway. But we're happy to study together 1 Peter chapter 2. What a wonderful book, 1 Peter. And, and as we get into chapter 2, we'll notice we've looked through uh, several verses already. We're down to verse 9. We've looked through verses beginning at verse 1 and some things you probably have highlighted in your Bible already. Uh, verse 2 says, like newborn babes, you probably have that highlighted. Um, some of the words in verse 1 that we saw, we saw all, we underlined all, we saw that several times, deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander and all those things, and we talked about those. And we talked about growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and growing as a Christian, and certainly any time that we're in any situation, we want to grow as a Christian. And then we talked in verse 4 and 5, talking about being Jesus was a living stone, or God was a living stone, and uh, or, which the builders rejected. And we are also two living stones. And then we looked at a few verses. Now we come to verse 9, where the Bible says this, but you, but you, well, that's you and I, isn't it? Christians. Christians are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Oh, what a wonderful couple of verses in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 9 and 10. You see, the continuity between the church and Israel was, was never far from Peter's mind. The apostle went beyond the equation of Christians with the nation chosen by God and called out uh, of Egypt to be the in Christ is to partake of a chosen race. It's also to share in the priesthood of Aaron, if you will. And Israel's holiness as a nation was often seriously flawed. The work of Christ has changed all that. And now people who are not people have become people of God. In verse 9, there is an empathetic you at the beginning of the sentence, if you notice that, but you. And that's talking about all those who have followed Christ. Thousands and thousands of people have followed Christ. But you, that empathetic you, after just saying that the disobedience stumble over Christ in previous verses, Peter said, but you, and told them that they were altogether different. But we see these nouns, and each of these nouns have qualifiers, if you will. The chosen, the race is chosen, the priesthood is royal, the nation is holy, and the people are God's own possession. So we see a frequency of these five here. And perhaps nothing was more basic to the Jewish self-conscious than God had chosen them. Certainly that was the case, wasn't it? We, we know that about the Old Testament. Israel stood alone as God's chosen people. Christians stand alone as God's chosen people. And other nations in the Old Testament were not chosen, but the Jewish nation was. And, and as Christians, we are God's chosen people. And through Christ, the chosen race are those of every nation People, people will accept the call. So look at Acts chapter 10 and verses 3 to 4. We have Peter and Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35. Opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. God is not one. God wants everyone to be saved. From every nation, from every tribe, from every culture, everyone to be saved. And so he's not one to show partiality. But in the Old Testament, to, to, to be God's first people, if you will, he chose the, the Jewish nation. And in the New Testament, he chooses Christians, but everyone can become a Christian. Verse 35 says, But in every nation, a man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. Welcome to God. Well, as we kind of analyze 
verses, especially verse 9, this afternoon, this evening. Peter, we see, but you are, but you are. Peter is finished with his unfolding of the revelation or of the relevant scripture that presented Jesus as a living stone. That wonderful scripture. Now he is launching into the topic of holy priesthood, if you will. But you are looking at us as, as really this holy priest. And I, I know if you're like me, I, I don't think of myself as a priest and probably never would. But Peter would say, you're a, you're a holy priesthood. Now, which would get our mind thinking about this. Well, if, if the Bible would call a Christian holy, well, then certainly we should be holy. And we should work to act like we're holy. What do you think? All the words in verse 9 are taken from Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 and 6. Now this is a passage in which there is a, a series of collective nouns, all of which are in the singular and are which are used in Old Testament times to describe Israel. So when we look at verse 9, at the beginning it says, you are a chosen race. Well, we're describing Israel. A royal priesthood. Well, we're describing Israel. A holy nation. A people for God's own possession. And so these, these nouns here we see in Exodus chapter 19 as as describe or chapter yeah 19 verse 5 and 6 as describing Israel so it should be no surprise to us when we're describing the church that we're and we're God's chosen uh, of this generation that the qualifiers would be the same Galatians chapter 6 and verse 16 says this and those who will walk by this rule Peace and mercy be upon them and upon them or upon the Israel of God. The word you, okay, so the word you is emphatic and draws a contrast between believing and unbelieving. So in 16, and those who will be walked according to this rule and peace and mercy upon them and upon the Israel of God. And so we have, you know, but you are, but you are. Well, what are we? What are we as Christians? This is a chosen race. Christians are chosen by God. And we've looked at that before. It's wonderful to be chosen by God. It's wonderful to be chosen by Christ. It's really wonderful to be chosen by anybody, but certainly a God. God loves you. God loves me so much that he wants us to worship him. He wants to choose us and, and, be, and, and for us to be his special people. We have been chosen for service, service to our God. Matthew chapter 21, verse 42 through 44, Jesus said to them, and Jesus says this, Did you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord and is marvelous in your eyes. Therefore, I say the kingdom of God will be taken away from me or away from you, and given to a people, producing the fruit of it. And he who falls on the stone will be broken into pieces, but whoever, whomever it falls, it will shatter him like dust. And so we have this verse 43 there, right in the middle. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to the people producing the fruit. He's talking to the Jewish nation at this time, Jesus is, and saying, listen, you have an obligation to, as Christians, to produce fruit. You are, you have been chosen, Israel. You've been chosen for service. You've been chosen for a job. You've been chosen for a duty. You haven't been chosen just to sit there and say, "I'm a chosen." I'm a chosen race. I'm a chosen nation. And so, when we look at Christians, we have been chosen. But what have we been chosen for? We've been chosen to worship God. That is an act that that would take work on our part, isn't it? We have to get up on Sunday morning, the Lord's Day. We have to sing songs. We have to pray. We have to study God's Word. We have to, to partake around the Lord's Supper. We have to give of our means. Those five acts of worship are, are, are things that we are chosen to do. But much, much more than that, we're chosen to serve. Well, so, but you are, are chosen. What are we chosen? We're a chosen, uh, a royal priesthood. 
Now, the word translated royal here can be either a noun or an adjective. And some take it as a noun, make it as kind of a fifth title applied to the church, if you will. Like you would see some titles in the Old Testament. Others take it as an objective modifier, modifying the word priesthood, and then explain that Christians are both kinds and priest. Revelation 1 verse 6 would show us that. Or that they see some reference to the fact that Christians sit with God and reign with him. That's a wonderful thing to think about. Revelation chapter 5 and, and verse 10 would show us that. How Christians would sit with God and reign with him. What a thought is that, that we could be at the right hand of God. Look at Revelation chapter 5 and verse 10 with me if you will. The Bible says, you have made them to be king, to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. So we see this as, as reigning with Jesus, and so we're, we're priesthood. Can you think of that being with Jesus? I love 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and in that section, verses 13 through 18, talking about those who died in Christ will rise first. And, and then we see in verse 18, thus so will always be with the Lord. And what a wonderful thought that is. We don't want to look at death or anything like that, but what a wonderful thought that is to, to give us hope that someday we will be with the Lord. So Christians need to understand, to, to think of themselves as highly as Peter and John think of themselves, namely as priests and kings. Well, we need to think of ourselves in this aspect. Now, we don't want to be cocky or, or anything like that. But in this aspect, that our relationship with Christ, our relationship with God, as he has made us, he has counted us worthy to priests and kings. Well, what else? A holy nation. As was true of previous phrases, we see this coming from Exodus chapter 19, and this time in verse 6. Holy means a holy nation, means set apart, sanctified, different. Christians, just be honest, are different, aren't they? We should be different because we have something to look forward to, maybe in this life a little bit, but much more in the next life. We're a different, we're separate from, from other nations, separate from other people, and consecrated to the word of God. Uh, now, the word nation give, gives the idea of as church as a people or, or a body, and certainly that's the case. So Christians constitute, in a special sense, the Lord's special nation. And so we are a holy people. We're a holy nation. And, and it's wonderful when you think of the church as, a, as God's people, as God's nation. But next we would see this phrase, a people for God's own possession. And automatically think God owns us. And, and you know what? That's okay with me. That's okay with me to be God's own possession. If I'm going to be a possession of anyone, I certainly want it to be God. Christians are described, once again, in this language we see from Exodus chapter 19, as Israel was, was described, God's special property. You might say, well, I don't want anybody to own me. Well, somebody's going to own you. It's going to be Satan or it's going to be God. We see that in Romans chapter 6 when we talk about being slaves to sin or slaves to righteousness. And we'd much rather be slaves to righteousness. And, and this term that's used to be applied to Israel is now applied to the church. Believers are special people. We are special people. The private and special treasured possession of God. We belong to God. And what a wonderful thought that is. Well, the next phrase we see there is that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you. So first we see these, these qualifiers, if you will. We're a royal priesthood. We're, we're a holy nation. We're a people of God's own possession. Well, why are we so close really related to God? Why does God want to have this relationship with us? Well, we go back to John 3, 16, don't we? For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son. So we see this relationship of love with God, and so we understand that. But what is our task as Christians? We ask yourself, what, what, what do I, you say, well, uh, we come to serve and worship. We certainly do. But look at what Peter would say here, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you. 
Peter here states the purpose why his readers are what they are, why Christians are what they are. Where God's special people were saved to serve, and, and that's what a priest does. A, a priest serves, and, and he does. Ju he doesn't just sit there and quietly contemplate that he's a priest, while while doing nothing for his master. But a priest is a servant. Well. When we see this out of darkness into his marvelous light, well, we see this picture of darkness, don't we? And, 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 and we can study through the Bible and see darkness that, and, and how that affects people and, and things and, and understand that. But the time when the Christian priests are so called was, was, you know, this darkness it was their conversion. Darkness is often used metaphorically to stand for the dominion of Satan and light for the dominion of God. So the time when Christian priests were so called was, was their, their conversion. And, and we like to think of our conversion thinking of, I've been called out of darkness. I've been called out of sin. And it's a wonderful thing to be called out of the world, out of sin, out of darkness, isn't it? Sometimes we, we, we don't think that much about it and becoming a Christian and, and the acts of becoming a Christian are in Scripture. How to become a Christian is in Scripture. And I think of Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7 comes to mind. And as we look in that text, you know, I think about there's a lot of good people in this world, isn't there? There's a lot of people that do a lot of nice things, especially in a time like we're going through with with the COVID virus, and, and certainly we are grateful for good people that serve on our front lines, but religiously we have to be right with God. And I think of this verse in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, and Jesus says these words in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Do we understand that? Not everyone will go to heaven. And, and so only the people that are called out of darkness into this marvelous light. These are Christians. Those are people who have been obedient. Look at verse 22 of Matthew 7. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles? Verse 23, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye who practice lawlessness. Now that last section of verse 23 is a quote from the Old Testament of Psalms chapter 6 and verse 8. But, but no one would want the Lord to ever look at them and say, I don't know you. So when we think of this passage, many would say to me, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? But we go up to verse 21 say, Not everyone who said to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But who will? Who will? But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So we need to find out. If you, if you haven't already find out, found out what the will of God is for you, take a minute and stop and, and find out through the scriptures. And if you need assistance, you can send me a note. And I will be glad to, to give you scriptures and, and study with you so, so that you can find out. Looking over the book of Acts, chapter 26 and verse 17. The Acts chapter 26 and 17 and 18, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you to open their eyes. This is talking about the Apostle Paul at the time. Paul is sending them from Jews to Gentiles so that they would know, they would understand, to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light. Darkness to light. From the dominion of Satan to God. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Turn from darkness to light. From Satan to God. That they may receive the forgiveness of sins and the an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. So when we see this scripture there, Acts 26, 17, and 18, we see Paul going from one nation to the other nation. Because God loves everyone, doesn't he? And, and, and so when we turn to Jesus, we find the power of sin is broken. We can be free and are a part 
of the kingdom of God. We are walking in the light of his word, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. If you walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have forgive that forgiveness there, that, that, that original word from there is a cleansing. That cleansing is, is a continual cleansing. As long as I'm walking in the light, I'm continually cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And it's so, so important for that to happen. Walking in the light. We, we, we walk in the light of his word. That, that means we, we try to study and understand and apply that word to our day. That when we sin, yes, but we come back to the word of God. The difference is night and day. Jesus is the light. That light is marvelous. It's wonderful. It's, it's extraordinary. It, it causes amazement. But when we look at verse 10 of 1 Peter chapter 2, for you once were not a people. That's, that's a hard phrase, isn't it? You, were, you weren't anybody. You weren't a people. But then he says, now you are the people of God. See, he took it from being really a nobody to being to, uh, the highest standard that, that, that you can get. You weren't, you weren't anybody, but now you're the people of God. You hadn't received mercy, but now you have mercy. So he continued to draw the language and imagery of the Old Testament, reinforces readers, uh, the confidence. Christians need confidence that we are the people of God. We are God's own people. Let us not forget that. No matter what happens in this world, we are the people of God. And God will always take care of us. Hosea's words, we see Hosea's words in this scripture here. Peter found them in the, in the message reassuring for his largely Gentile Christian audience. Once they were not a people, he said, but now you are a people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Peter's message was different from Hosea's slightly in that there was no judgment in Peter's words. The Gentiles had previously been ignorant of God's promises and, and God's mercy, but now they were a people, the very people of God. We are, if, if, friends, if you're a Christian today, April 16th, 2020, guess what? You're a person, a people of God. In Romans chapter 9, verse 25 and 26, Paul cited Hosea once again, more precisely than Peter did, but for Paul, too, the words of Hosea, Hosea demonstrated that God's people are not from among Jews only, but from among Gentiles. You see in Romans chapter 9, 25, he said also in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people, my people, and her who was not my beloved, beloved. And Peter had read the Roman letter possibly had because it's been previously written and that he would understand uh, Paul's thoughts on this matter. What a couple wonderful verses there that we have in, in verse 9 and 10. And then it goes in verse 11, but, or excuse me, verse 11, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers abstain from fresh, fleshly lust which war against the soul. You know, sin wars against the soul. When he says aliens, if we're God's chosen people, this is now, sin is now a little bit alien to us. But yet sin is trying, still trying to knock on your door, trying to get into your soul, and trying to drive you off the tracks, if you will. But he, he says, I, I, you know, as aliens and strangers, to, I urge you to, to abstain from that. Stay away from that fleshly war. And others, don't try not to get into that battle, that battle of sin that, that we've looked at in the book of James uh, uh, just recently. And then he says in verse 12, keep your behavior excellent. Ah, that's an underliner if I've ever seen one. If you have your marker, I hope you do. Uh, underline that. Keep your behavior. How should I behave? Keep your behavior excellent. It says among the Gentiles. I, I would say among the Gentiles, among the Jews, among anybody in this world, as Christians, we need to keep our behavior excellent. Because guess what? If I go out into the world and I, I stop at a store and keep my social distancing at the store, but they see a bad attitude in me, they're going to think, well, 
is that person a Christian? And, and if they see cuss words come out of my mouth, they're going to think, is that person a Christian? And, and if they see anger in me, they're going to think, is that person a Christian? But what if I have a shirt on? I don't today. I, well, I have a shirt. But if I had a shirt that said, you know, Minister Sunrise Church of Christ in big letters and had my name on it, and, and they look at that, and then they look at my behavior, can they put the two of them together and say, well, this person is, what, keeping his behavior excellent? You see, the idea here is they should be able to look at us and look at our behavior and not need a sign that says what they are, but from our good behavior, our excellent behavior, know that we are a, what, go back up, put your arrow from verse 12 all the way to verse 9. We're a chosen race. We're a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation. We are God's own special people. So back down to verse 12, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. So in the things which they slander you as evildoers, they may become your good, they may, they may because of your good deeds as they observe them glorify God in the day of visitation. So a different color highlighter, the purpose of, of us keeping our behavior excellent is what? So that they Circle they, what they, they may observe them and glorify God. So the purpose of our behavior being excellent is, is to win them to Christ that God may be glorified. You say, well, I can't study with somebody. I can't open the Bible. I don't know what verses to go to. I, I don't know what to say. I get tongue-tied. I get nervous. I, I just That's just not me. And I try to invite people to church, and they don't come. And, of course, we can't come to a building right now, but certainly you can tune in or have them tune in or share or something like that. But yet we can all be the people God wants us to be and a nation that God wants us to be because we are a chosen race. We're a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation. We're different. We're set apart. We're not going to be like the guy down the street. We're God's own special people. Why? So that we can keep our behavior excellent. Why? So that we'll bring glory to God our Father. We hope that you're blessed today. If you have a need, please let us know. You can email or text or even in, I see the comments as they go on Facebook. I, I see it as it goes on um, YouTube, email through YouTube or Facebook or, or text or something. We love you. God loves you. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this day. Father, we're grateful for any time that we can just stop for a minute and open your word and understand the things that are in your word and, and, and know how they affect our lives. They affect our lives for eternity. Father, this is important stuff. We thank you for the word of God that we can study it. Father, we thank you for each person watching through video. Bless them. Father, be with our country and bless it at this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.